I'd like to uh, start off by thanking the organizers for allowing me to be part of this discussion. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, when Lita asked me to give this talk, she um, wanted me to talk on the impact of uh, the gut microbiome on host epithelial functions and responses. And I'm going to do that, but um, largely through inspiration received from Owen White yesterday, I decided to go rogue last night. And I uh, shortened my talk uh, to allow more time for discussion of the gaps, needs, and challenges. Um, I'm still going to talk about uh, uh, um, what uh, my charge is, but at, uh, towards the end, I think you'll see that I'm going to go outside of that charge to uh, talk about things and I think broadly apply to research and hopefully will advance some of our thinking and approaches to the study of human uh, microbiomes. So um, this slide just is a compilation of uh, examples of how uh, critical gut epithelial functions are impacted by microbes, and uh, they include a variety of functions, uh, for example, barrier function, development, wound healing, uh, immune functions, cytoprotection, transport, autophagy, and proliferation and apoptosis. And um, I think that you will appreciate that many of these processes are quite essential for allowing the gut epithelium to be the interface between us and the outside world, or in the case of our own microbiota, our inside world. Uh, they provide very important functions in separating us, but also there are selective barriers so that we absorb critical nutrients, water, and electrolytes that uh, we need to sustain life. Now, uh, what I'm going to do in the next few slides are show some specific examples, and, and these are just examples in, uh, that come from a literature that is re replete with both mechanisms and uh, uh, processes that have been identified uh, that mediate how microbes affect epithelial function. Shown on the left is uh, just a stain for KI67, which is a marker of cellular proliferation. And you can see that uh, in the control, the colonic crypt is uh, 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 shown here. And in the lower half of the colonic crypt are uh, most of the proliferating cells. But if you take this mouse and you treat this mouse with a cocktail of broad spectrum antibiotics over a period of a few weeks, you see a dramatic change. There's uh, mucosal atrophy with a significant decrease in cellular proliferation. Now, proliferation is only one side of that coin, and if uh, you look at apoptosis, which is also important in maintenance of epithelial homeostasis, um, I refer you to this study by Brent Polk and his group, uh, where they identified two peptides that were secreted by uh, lactobacillus GG, uh, which they called P40 and P75. And uh, both of these panels uh, uh, show staining for apoptosis, which is in brown. And you can see that after treatment of uh, uh, the mucosa with TNF, you get a significant increase of uh, apoptosis. But if you pretreat that tissue with either uh, P75 or P40, you can significantly abrogate the uh, induced apoptosis. Um, the next slide is an example, one of many, uh, but this one come from, comes from our laboratory of uh, conditioned media from bifido brev, uh, which protects um, uh, both uh, mouse jejunum as well as human CACO2 epithelial cells uh, um, protects their barrier function against react a reactive oxygen species. And that's illustrated here. That is, uh, here are the controls, and uh, in this case, we're measuring um, paracellular flux using tritiated mannitol. Uh, when you add the uh, ROS, you can see that the barrier function breaks down both here and here. But if you pretreat these tissues with conditioned media from uh, bifido brev, you can mitigate that uh, effect on barrier function. Now, one of my favorite 
examples, and I think a, is a very good example of uh, host microbe interaction, is the induction of heat shock proteins. Uh, so heat shock proteins are highly conserved proteins, and in the gut, they're, uh, they're, they're physiologically expressed in two regions of the GI tract. One is the stomach, and then the other is the colon. And I don't think that that's uh, by uh, uh, chance. Uh, these are the two most hostile areas of the gastrointestinal tract. And I, as I will show you, these heat shock proteins are absolutely essential for maintenance of intestinal homeostasis. But uh, there's something very unusual that I wanted to highlight by showing you this Swiss roll of immunostaining for one of the heat shock proteins, HSP25. So a Swiss roll is basically where we remove the colon and then we cut along the mesenteric border, we roll it up, and then we slice it like a uh, Swiss roll. And what that allows us to do is look at protein expression uh, both along the vertical axis as well as the longitudinal axis. And I think you can appreciate by the brown staining that there is a, uh, most of the heat shock protein is expressed by the surface colonocytes. That is exactly the cells that are in direct opposition to uh, the luminal fluid and gut microbes. Uh, the other thing I think you can appreciate is that there's a gradient of expression, which is largest in the proximal colon, but then begins to dissipate and is almost undetectable by the time you get to the rectum. Now, one of the things that we noticed immediately was that, um, or we thought of immediately, is that perhaps the reason that these uh, proteins are being physiologically maintained is because they're getting cues from microbes. And uh, in support of that, if you look in a germ-free mouse or if you antibiotic treat a mouse, uh, what you find is that you uh, um, get an abrogation of the expression of these heat shock proteins. Now, implied from that is that if this gradient, if it is due to cues from microbes, then there must be a gradient or there must be a heterogeneity of uh, microbes that are found in the proximal versus the distal colon. And I think that through studies that we've done, both of 16S as well as metagenomic profiling, this indeed is true. And that's shown on this slide. So, this is a study where we uh, did a colonoscopy in a healthy human subject, um, and uh, this was uh, done in a patient or a, a, a volunteer that underwent this procedure without colonic lavage. That is, we, didn't, we tried best not to perturb the uh, communities of microbes in uh, the colon. By doing so, I think that you can appreciate that the metagenomic profiles of the mucosa-associated micro, uh, microbiota are quite different between the right colon and left colon. And uh, each slice of these uh, pie charts represents different subsystems, functional subsystems. The fact that these heat shock proteins are absolutely important for maintenance of intestinal homeostasis is illustrated here. So if you take uh, a wild type mice and uh, treat them with uh, dextran sodium sulfate, a uh, agent that will induce colitis, uh, wild type mice typically will develop inflammation, but it, it will spontaneously resolve over about a two to three week period. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a mouse where the gene for HSP70 uh, is deleted, these mice do very poorly. They uh, actually ha exhibit much more severe colitis, and after several treatments of DSS, they go on to a chronic-like colitis that is sustained. And the colitis is very typical of what we see in human ulcerative colitis. There is the presence of cryptapsises, <coughs> branching crypts, and also inflammatory infiltrates. Uh, these mice also develop the typical IBD uh, metaplasia to carcinoma sequence of uh, cancers uh, that we see in our patients. Now, a lot is known, uh, and the literature is quite robust uh, with regard to how microbes affect the host side. 
What is really less well known are what are the mediators that microbes use to impact epithelial function. A few have been identified, and I list them here. They include things like quorum sensing molecules, uh, innate ligands, uh, short chain fatty acids and lactic acid, hydrogen sulfide, chemotactic peptides, and uh, certain metabolites. But this is certainly not an uh, all inclusive list, and it's only uh, the tip of the iceberg. And um, uh, discovery and identification of other agents. Uh, uh, awaits better technology to be able to uh, detect them. So this is a segue to my slide on uh, what are our gaps in our knowledge in gut microbe epithelial interactions. Well, I think there are three major ones. One is that, uh, as I mentioned, we have rudimentary knowledge and inventories of uh, bioactive microbe derived factors. But our understanding of the complexity and heterogeneity of gut epithelial functions, particularly as they relate to microbial selection, assemblage, and region-specific interactions, I think are um, incomplete. We also um, have an incomplete vetting and understanding of the above in the context of human biology and uh, pathobiology. So at this point, I am going to um, uh, broaden my comments to uh, what I think are the challenges and needs. And th this not only applies to studies of the gut epithelium, but to uh, studies in general in the area of human microbiome research. And I group them into three categories. Uh, and the first category are uh, human studies. Um, so HMP1 was uh, largely devoted to uh, the study of humans, and I think that uh, a lot of useful information came out of that uh, uh, project. Uh, but the limitations are the following. Uh, most of the data that we have to date is observational or associative. And uh, part of the reason for that is that people are really difficult to study, and they're different. Uh, you can't do much with them or to them. Um, the other problem is that uh, we often look at our microbiota data in the context of sort of archaic disease classifiers that clinicians often use to help them manage their patients. But these disease classifiers are based on symptoms and uh, course in disease and not necessarily reflective of the kind of underlying pathophysiology. I think another uh, limitation, and uh, maybe this was a, a, a necessity, is that the, B, the HMP1 was really a technology-driven uh, effort, and uh, we, it was an important effort for, and helped us uh, vet and develop some consensus in the way that we study gut microbes. But I think in doing so, um, the importance of bi biological drivers uh, was uh, minimized. And um, uh, in part, they were addressed uh, by the uh, human demonstration projects. But I think we need m many more human demonstration projects to move that forward. And associated with that is, you know, we, we've taken a bottom-up approach. That is, we, uh, we now have an immense amount of data that we are sorting through. And from that data, we put together hypotheses that we then look back onto the clinical situation and try to think if it's relevant. My view is that maybe that might be backwards and that we ought to really look at from the clinical situation and then at, from that develop various hypotheses that we will then develop or explore in uh, clinical studies as well as experimental counterparts. I think there are uh, major issues that I had brought up in the discussion yesterday which are technical. We still don't have consensus on how to sample patients. Uh, I'll show you an example of that shortly. Uh, I think quality control is an issue. Um, we don't have any uh, well-accepted or standardized uh, operating procedures. Uh, 
And I think that this really affects the interpretation of data. It's the old garbage in, garbage out story. And I think we have to pay much more attention to uh, getting together and developing optimal ways to achieving uh, uh, a better upfront uh, result. Um, the other part uh, of the technology is that I don't think that we've done a good job in vetting it. So I always tell my colleagues that, uh, that sh who show me the metatranscriptome or metagenomic data, I, I ask them, well, what does it mean? You know, and, and what do you, and how do you account for it? I mean, do you, do you really know that this data is true? Uh, and I think that um, we, we really haven't done a good job in actually uh, vetting whether our interpretations of uh, these omics data is correct. And in that regard, I think we need, need to do a better job at building a, a toolbox that uh, can be more direct measures of microbial function. Uh, the third category I lumped into experimental and data analysis. And um, here I think that uh, I'm just going to echo some of the things that Sarkis and others have said. I think we really have to think about experimental and animal models as part of uh, uh, studies of the human microbiome. Just studying the human is not going to get you far enough. And I think the approach has to be where you have to do these two approaches in, in tandem. Um, I think that the integration of uh, large da data sets is a problem, but also the fact that uh, uh, location is very important. For example, if you do a stool sample and you're looking at an inflammatory process that may be localized to a different part of the GI tract, how do you truly know that that the alterations that you see in the stool are going to be reflective of what is happening at the local level. Um, I think we need to uh, think about or uh, really strive to complete our inventories of microbial transcriptomes, proteomes, and metabolomes because at the current uh, point, I think that this is a major bottleneck. Now, let me give you some specific examples of uh, the points that I uh, tried to make. So I mentioned yesterday that inflammatory bowel diseases are described as two clinical phenotypes, one Crohn's disease, the other one called ulcerative colitis. Uh, they don't necessarily reflect the pathophysiology, and the pathophysiology can be quite uh, varied. Uh, so when we're trying to relate that to uh, microbial data or host microbe interactions, we may, in some instances, be in com uh, comparing apples and oranges. But to add to that, uh, you can uh, look at what happens in patients with Crohn's disease. So this is um, uh, data that came out of a study that was published uh, many years ago, but reflects the fact that IBD, in this case Crohn's disease, is a progressive uh, disease, and the natural histories among patients vary. So what you see in the early part of disease, which is mostly an inflammatory type, may not be what you see later in disease. And I think that that really affects the interpretation of your data. So if you did your sampling at T1, it's going to be very different from what happens in T2. And if you sample at T0, that is before the onset of disease, um, this is an ideal time point to be able to capture events before the disease happens. So you know a little bit of what cause and effect is. But the problem is that we have no way of predicting or identifying people who are at high risk for developing inflammatory bowel diseases. So, most studies, in fact, I would say all studies uh, pretty much have looked at uh, post-inflammatory events. Now, another um, challenge is this. So this is a lesion, an ulceration in a patient with Crohn's disease. Uh, and so what typifies these diseases is their topography. Uh, ulcerative colitis only involves the colon, always starts in the rectum. It's a mucosal disease. Crohn's disease, on the other hand, is a patchy disease, and it can involve any part of the GI tract. 
So if you look at this lesion, this is inflamed and ulcerated, but over here it's normal. So when we do a stool sample, what does it reflect? We really need to biopsy or sample around this lesion. Now if we sample, do we sample here, here, or in here? And how do we sample? Do we do a pinch biopsy or do we do a brushing? So none of these things have been truly resolved and there's no consensus. But they will affect the outcome of your data interpretation. So I may seem, uh, having present, presented this, uh, like a pessimist. And, um, but I can tell you, those are the people in my lab know that I am an uh, eternal optimist. And I believe there's a solution to every problem. So um, one of them is that we were fortunately funded by the Human Microbiome Project uh, to do one of the demonstration projects, and we selected um, palchitis. Uh, this is a, a proced surgical procedure that's performed in patients with severe ulcerative colitis. They, they get their colon removed, which is curative. But for continence, what happens is the surgeons fashion a pouch that represents a pseudo-rectum, which is anastomose to the anus so that they can have voluntary bowel movements. Now, uh, half of or more of these patients will develop a condition that looks very much like all the original ulcerative colitis. And the other interesting thing is that if you do the same procedure in a patient that doesn't have IBD, somebody who has a familial form of colon cancer, very few of those patients develop palchitis. So this is something that we think is unique to ulcerative colitis and may recapitulate some of the pathophysiological events uh, related to that disease. We know it's microbe dependent because the treatment of choice is uh, uh, antibiotics. Uh, this is, uh, a, uh, most of the patients will develop this condition within a year which makes it an ideal uh, project because you can do it prospectively. You can sequentially sample your patients uh, unprepped and over time and uh, be able to maybe capture events before they happen. Um, and then patients serve as their own controls, which I think is very important to design in most human trials of, uh, that look at the uh, microbiome. Now, a lot of useful information has uh, been gained from the, uh, this uh, study, and Vince Young is going to present that later in the morning, so I'm not going to get into it. But even after uh, uh, looking at that data and uh, trying to project out what it means, I think we're encumbered by the fact that we still uh, are, have correlations and associations. So, my argument is that we have to develop better animal models. And in this regard, I think that we propose a, uh, a model that's been around a long time that fulfills a number of the criteria that recapitulate some of the events in uh, the human palchitis condition. So this is a blind loop that's surgically created so that uh, this is the mainstream of the ileum, and then off to the side is this uh, uh, pouch. And if you orient the motility this way, it empties. If you orient the motility this way, it fills. But uh, over a period of days to weeks, this self-filling loop gets colonized and pretty much begins to look like a colon. As you can see, this looks somewhat like this. This looks like the ileum. And uh, if you look at the microbiota, indeed, they develop uh, a colonic-like microbiota, as we see in the uh, human ileal pouches, um, that uh, clusters very closely to the sham-operated colon, whereas the self-emptying uh, clusters very close to the uh, uh, sham-operated ileum. And then if you look at how the microbiota from these pouches compare to the human pouch, you can see that up here in the green uh, is the self-emptying loop, which is away from the human samples here, whereas uh, the self-filling is somewhere in between but closer to the human samples, suggesting that we're recapitulating some of the uh, changes in human microbiota. Uh, 
Now, the other thing is uh, you have to ask why does uh, uh, pouchitis, if it reflects ulcerative colitis, occur in a small intestinal tissue? That's because that's what the small, the, uh, the pouch is made from. And we have to hypothesize that there are transformations of the small intestine to a large intestine. And this is actually seen in human pouches, but we uh, also show that that is true in the uh, mouse pouch. So this is just to show you the normal colon in the mouse, and then uh, with the filling loop, you see that the histology with these elongate test tube-like crypts uh, resembles that uh, that we see in the normal colon, whereas the emptying loop stays pretty much like the small intestine. And then the gene signatures are also very similar. That is, the filling loop is very similar to the colon, whereas uh, the emptying is close to the ileum. And <clears throat> uh, but we notice that uh, even though um, we get colonization, that is insufficient by itself to uh, uh, cause inflammation. And uh, so we added uh, uh, to this a uh, genetic uh, variable where these IL-10 mice were subjected to the same procedure. And you can see that with the genetic susceptibility, they develop inflammation, but if um, uh, uh, up here in the self-filling loop, but not in the self-emptying loop. So the working model that we have from this, mod, uh, from this uh, mouse model is that uh, this is a three-legged stool representing uh, the uh, uh, importance of colonic metaplasia. Uh, the development of a colonic microbiota may be dysbiosis and some form of genetic susceptibility. None of these are sufficient by themselves and you need to have the perfect storm in order for this uh, event or pouchitis and maybe ulcerative colitis to develop. So in moving forward, we're, moving, uh, we're beginning to go back to our patients and beginning to look at the host side because looking at microbiota alone out of context with the host, I think we lost a lot of opportunity. But to look at the host side, we have to really understand that the gut mucosa is a complex multicellular tissue. And that's shown by this uh, uh, picture here. This is the microbial world here, and then there's a mucus layer in between, and then this is us. But uh, our mucosa is made up of many different types of cell types. And if you uh, just take a biopsy and you do, for example, gene expression, it's going to represent an admixture of cells. And I think through a variety of technologies, for example, laser capture, we can actually look at individual compartments and then through a systems biology approach determine how they fit together as a, uh, as a puzzle. And then there are other new technologies like the development of enteroids uh, where we can uh, um, develop fairly mature structures that we can then look at host microbe relationships. So with that I'm going to end and um, uh, I'd be happy to entertain any further discussion or questions. Thank you. Gene, thank you for a great overview and for, I think, clearly articulating some of the gaps, needs, and challenges. I think we could have time for maybe one question while Balfour's coming up to the mic. Maybe I could just ask quickly, in these enteroid models, um, are indigenous microbiota being retained as, as you develop no, these enteroids? The, so these, are, these enteroids are derived uh, from... Um, stem cells that uh, you can harvest. For, for the mouse, it's fairly easy to do, and I, the technology is now uh, feasible even in humans. Uh, but they have to be uh, established in sterile conditions. Uh, Sartor, uh, University of North Carolina. Uh, Gene, great uh, discussion points. We need a full afternoon, but I totally support your idea of host uh, microbial interactions. We need to genotype all of these patients that we're getting the microbiota on, uh, and fully also support the uh, mechanistic uh, necessity for mechanism exploration and appropriately chosen mouse models, uh, ma making sure that they're appropriate. Uh, and I love your self-filling blind loop. Quick question. Uh, 
and that is on the chronicity of your HSP 70 uh, knockout mouse with, I couldn't tell whether it's a single or several doses of DSS. Did that extend into the small intestine? And could you comment quickly on the differences in the protective mechanisms and uh, resiliency of the small intestine recovery yeah, versus so the colon? Thanks for asking that. So actually what happens is that they, as you know, the uh, IL-10 knockout, my, my, our, the DSS is a typical distal colitis. What we see is that the colitis will extend uh, like ulcerative colitis, up to the proximal colon, but it doesn't go into the ileum. Yeah, but it can. Uh, so in our RGM knockout mice, we actually get an ileitis uh, in, in, uh, in, in the susceptible host. And DSS certainly is pervasive throughout the intestine because you give it orally. So it's, it's just that uh, there is a particular propensity, but, but I was just wondering if it extended in that particular setting. Yeah. It can in other uh, genetically susceptible hosts. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Susan Erdman from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her talk will be Wound Healing Longevity, Harnessing the Microbe-Induced Hormonal and Immune Proficiency for Human Health. 